Here in Nehemiah chapter 2, we pick up the story. It's an incredible story. I love the book so much because it has to do with a man of incredible character. The more you study Nehemiah, the more you look at it, you begin to read how much character. He was not anything except a cupbearer. And what is interesting about a cupbearer in those days, you think, well, I know what it is. It's just somebody who tastes the wine. Well, he did. He was responsible for that. He would keep the king alive. But he also would taste the food. But even on top of that, the main responsibility of a cupbearer is that he would stand in front of the king's house and the door. And no one could go in unless they went through Nehemiah. Not even the wife, not even the family could go into the king's palace. Now, why would that be? Well, you know that many of the kings were killed by their brothers and so on. Many of the kings were killed by their wives. So the most trusted man in all the kingdom, guess who? Nehemiah, a Jew. So here is kind of an interesting thought. Daniel, the same thing. He had an excellent spirit. And you remember he said that I have the purpose in my heart that I am not going to eat that meat. And because he purposed when he was 15 years old, he was able to stand in the lion's den when he was 90. So if I'm going to stand when I'm 90 years old with the lion, it's because of what I did when I was 15 years old. He purposed. They didn't like it. But he said, listen, at the end of 10 days, you will see that we're 10 times better and 10 times wiser. And so the eunuch of the king's palace said, okay, we'll try it. And sure enough, they brought Nehemiah, they brought, uh, I should say, Daniel, and he was 10 times better. And so Daniel went from kingdom to kingdom to kingdom. He went from Nebuchadnezzar's kingdom to you remember the Medo-Persian's kingdom, Cyrus, Darius. He went all the way up to Basajah's kingdom. So he went through four kingdoms, and here's what they said about him. We're not going to find anything that we can find against him unless we come against his God. And Daniel was a man who prayed, and that's what they went after. And so when the edict was written by Darius that he would once again throw anyone who would pray to any other buddy but him, then he realized the mistake he made. So... They threw Daniel in that lion's den. The next day, Darius came and said, King, King, or Darius, or Daniel, Daniel, are you alive? He says, Oh, King, live forever. The God whom I serve continually, he has sent his angels to watch over me. And all of a sudden, we begin to see a pattern. Caleb had an excellent spirit. At 85, he could begin to climb a mountain and outdo any kids at all. So there's a thing about this excellent spirit. It means that you are filled with, with the anointing of God, that the work of the Holy Spirit is all over your life. And that all of a sudden, if you're dating, you're not messing around trying to touch her or trying to mess around see how far you can get. You're trying to respect her and you're trying to honor her and you want to put God first and you don't want to mess around more than she doesn't want you to mess around. In other words, she has found somebody who has an excellent spirit. Every other guy is into one thing and that's it. And so all of a sudden, you think, well, why did I end up with this guy? Because when you were dating, he treated the, the waitress horribly. He was on his best behavior, but he couldn't do that right either. And so you got what you got, and because you looked on the outside. We could never pray this prayer. God, if it's not your will, take him out of my life. No, can't pray that prayer. God, he's finally the guy I want. Well, then pray the prayer. Well, God, you always take away the things I give you. Well, great. Let him do it one more time. See, what, why are we afraid of giving God everything? And what happens is we think, no, this one, I'm going to make a decision. And do you realize the mistake you made? What about Hezekiah? God said to Hezekiah, you're going to die. Get your things together. And what did he do? Did he trust God? No. He turned over and wept and begged God with all of his heart. God, please give me 15 more years. And guess what? Finally, God just said, okay, I'm tired of your weeping you can't, you're crying too much. You're a king. I can't believe this. So you have 50 more years. What did he do in those two 15 years or 15 years? He did two major things that just messed everything up. Number one, he had a boy named Manasseh. And Manasseh was the guy that cut the prophet Isaiah in half. That's not a good thing. Secondly, one day he opened the house of treasury up to Nebuchadnezzar so he could see what was inside the house of God. You see, because of those two acts, all of a sudden, Jerusalem would now be under attack because of his foolishness. When it's time to go home, 
guess what? You want to go home. You don't want to beg God, plead with God, or stay longer with God. You want God to do what He wants to do. Nehemiah, the same way. He's a cupbearer in chapter 1. In chapters 2, all the way through chapter 6, he's going to be a construction guy. He's going to build the walls. Now, let me tell you how incredible this is. He built the walls around Jerusalem. If you guys are carpenters like I am, 52 days it was done. That is almost impossible. To build a city wall in 52 days. And it says Tobiah and Sanballat, they were completely bummed out. How did he do it? He had everyone working. The kings, he had the priests, he had the scribes, he had every single person doing the work. And guess how he did it? He made everybody work in their own backyard. So if you were doing your backyard, you were doing it, and all of a sudden your wife said, hey honey, that little crooked, isn't it? So you have to go back and straighten it out. And then all of a sudden I live next to you, and so all of a sudden I finally realized, well, your brick has to overlap my brick, and so we have to work together. And then over here, Dave's over here, and he's trying to do it, but he got sick. So guess what? You and I had to go over here and help David. We built our walls, and they were the most magnificent. Someone else said, hey, I think I'll put a waterfall on my wall, you know. And they built this wall, and they did it for the glory of God, and the walls were connected in 52 days. But he taught them how to work. And he also said, I didn't take what belonged to me, the money. I was a, at that point, I became a builder. I had right to be a governor. But I didn't take the money. I slept with them. I ate with them. We had one sword and we had a trowel. We worked and we fought and he taught his people how to do it. And so we see and then verses chapter 7 all the way through 13, he became what? A governor. So you could say in chapters 1 through 6, he rebuilt the walls. Then in chapter 7 through 13, he reorganized their lives. And what do I mean by that? He got into their life. He made them break up because they married women outside of the Jewish faith. He made them reorganize their life, and he brought back the glory of God. This guy was incredible, but he was a cupbearer. And so the last thing you could do is you did not want to get the king upset. How important was it? Well, let me say this. Daniel said from the going forth of the commandment to rebuild and restore the walls shall be what? 170,880 days. So from March 14th, 445 B.C., when Xerxes told him to go, to the day that Jesus Christ came in on a donkey, 32 A.D., was exactly 170,880 days. In other words, it was like 69 weeks or 69 times 350 or 360 days in a year, Babylonian calendar, and it was to the date. So it started from that day he went into the city. And one last thing before we dive in, he was 900 miles away. So he was having the time of his life until one day the brothers came and his own brother came and said, hey, have you heard how bad it is in Jerusalem? Ezra went to rebuild the city, or rebuild the temple. Zerubbabel did the same thing. They rebuilt the temple. But then it had been a few years. So Nehemiah found out, though the temple was built, the enemy was coming in and the people were going outside intermarrying. So you had this lack of separation Nehemiah, his burden just began to go crazy. So he didn't know what to do. And here is the, probably the golden nugget of all nuggets. In chapter 1, when all of a sudden he hears the news, it was at the beginning of the year. In chapter 2, where we're going to read right now, four months later. So guess what? This is the heart of this man. For four months he prayed, he fasted, he wept, and he mourned. Those four uh, adverbs. It's, he's just saying, bam, bam, bam. He mourned, he fasted, he prayed, and he wept. So guess what? When it was time, he was ready. So I want to teach you why you want to learn how to pray. And if I could do my kids again, I'd teach them how to pray. I think I was a good dad. I don't think I taught them how to pray the way I want to. Even now, in our church, we're getting, on Sunday night, we're praying as a congregation. And every day at 3 o'clock, we pray as a church. And that has changed our lives. So if I had to do it again, I would teach my kids how to pray. Why? Because teachers are a dime a dozen. But those that can touch God, those that can communicate to God, those who understand what it is to speak to God, those are the ones that God's going to do great exploits through. And so it's so important to understand this. And so if you're going through a tough time, I'm going to ask you to give it four more months. If you're thinking about divorcing your spouse, 
I want you to wait four more months. If you're thinking about quitting your job, wait four more months. Because I want you to make sure you're right on tune and not in the flesh. And so we're going to see this in a very profound way of what he did. So the character of Nehemiah comes out. He was a cupbearer, as I mentioned to you before. And we find out that the king said three questions to him. Exerces number one and verses one through three. He questioned, why are you so sad? That's a bad day because the king could kill you if you made him sad. And then in verse four and five, the question, what is it that you want? In other words, this king was really good. What is it that you want? Tell me. And then number three question in verse six through nine, how long is it going to take? So this king was really together. Tell me how long you're going to be gone. Are you going to come back? Yes, I am. But during these four months, it was not a time of waiting. It's a time of preparing. And that's where I believe Christians make a big mistake. They're waiting for God to do something. I don't think that's where it's at. I think you have to start preparing. When your heart's ready and that woman's heart's ready, God will bring the two of you together. But he could be speaking to her and you're not ready because you're just waiting for God to do something. Well, hey, guess what? You better be preparing. Or God could be preparing a job for you, and God could be preparing the work for you. Or the ministry for you, and God preparing your heart. And when God sees it time, then he brings it together. And that's what you want more than anything in your whole life. You want to give God time. And we don't. We mess our lives up, and we give God a week to get it together. Just give God time and space, and you cannot believe what he can do in and through your life. So he was full of the Spirit, Nehemiah. He was absolutely a guy that did not quit on the job. He pondered what God spoke to him. He went down. He looked at the rubbish. And I want to give you three things to think about. Jot these three things out. Because if you don't get anything else out of tonight, I want you to understand three things that are so important in your life. Number one, you have to see God through the rubbish. You have to look at all the things in your life and see God. For instance, when Simei was cussing and cursing David. And Joab said, can I take him out? David said, no. How do I know that God did not send Simei to deal in my heart? I don't know. My life has not been right. I've been in sin. This guy could be really a guy from God, so don't touch him. I deserve what I'm getting right now. Let him alone. Later on, he was killed. But right now, he didn't know. So could David see through Simei and see God work in his life. If he could, he wouldn't touch Simei unless God told him to. So number one, look at what you're going through. Maybe you're overweight. Maybe you're just going through a tough time physically, the pain in your life. Do you see God through that situation? If you can, that's great. It says that the donkey could not even go over the top of the rubbish. It was so bad. So he had to get off. He had to walk himself. And then it says he pondered this in his heart. He, for three days, he walked around and just looked at the problem of everything in his life. And that's exactly what happened at Jericho. They walked around, they walked around, they walked around for seven days on the last day, seven times, 13 times. Finally, it dawned on them, they can't bring this down. It's too big. This Jericho has mocked them. This Jericho has embarrassed them. If it was going to come down, God was going to do it from inside out. And that's exactly what happened. So you've been trying to tackle this thing, destroy this thing. Maybe it's pornography. You've been trying to deal with it. You can't do it. No, you can't. Why? Because you are into the realm of a supernatural evil. So it's going to take a supernatural work of the Holy Spirit. And it's going to take God in you to give you the strength to walk away from it because you're in bondage. And while you weren't paying attention, Satan began to wrap it. And your brain took it further and further, and your lust took it further and further. Now you want to get out of it, and you can't. So what do you do? Well, you can get help. That's great. Or you can bow your knee and ask God to fill you with the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And now you're going to attack it in the realm of the Spirit. Because the moment you bow your knee, heaven's going to go crazy. And the moment you confess, heaven's going to go crazy. Now you're going to be able to attack this thing in the realm of the Spirit. Because it won't come down. It will not come down. It's like a marriage. You cannot figure your husband out. And I can't figure my wife out. I just can't. I mean, I got married to her, remember, in one week. So I walked up and said, hey, are you going with anybody? No. Do you like anybody? No. Will you marry me? She goes, sure. So I called my mom and I said, mom, I'm getting married next week. Well, Stephen, what's your last name? I said, I don't know. I didn't ask her. 
<laughs> my mom said, are you on drugs again? No, mom. Well, it worked out. Don't do that. But it worked out. And so, you know, it, that's not the best way to do it. But we've been together, but we had to learn certain things in our life. So here he's saying, you know, number one, can you see God through the rubbish? Number two, you ready? Number two, can you see God through people? That means that you can see God through your wife. I don't know. We got in a big fight the other night. No. Can you see God through her? The Bible says don't go to bed with wrath on your heart. Make sure you kiss her. Make sure you tell her you love her. Well, you know what that's like? I know. It's like jumping out of an airplane at 30,000 feet with no parachute. You're going to die. You know, it's hard. But, you know, it's just true. Humble yourself. So, can you see God? No, I'm so bitter. I'm, I can't forgive. Well, that's interesting. So, people who can't forgive, people who are bitter basically don't see God in their life. They see what these people have done. But what about this? What about, yes, they've hurt you, but their life is miserable. And you have the freedom to set them free, and you won't. You think God's going to be upset with you? Absolutely. You are going to be thrown into the debtor's house. You're like the king that forgave that one brother. And then he went out and grabbed somebody else. And when the king found out that you were unloving, he went and got you and threw you in prison. Be careful. And then thirdly, he was able to see God in government. He was able to look through the trash and the lies and everything else and see at the end of the government there was a king of kings and the Lord was coming. So I ha I'm, I'm able to go to bed at night. I know too much, but I'm able to go to bed because I know one day Jesus Christ is going to come. Secondly, I know that behind my wife and all the things she's gone through, there's a God that loves her and loves me. And thirdly, I know no matter how much rubbish there is in my life, God is wanting to show me something and I have to see him. Same thing with the boat. He put the disciples there to teach them a lesson. What was the lesson? They had to see God. So in that storm, he didn't get in the boat. He stood there so they could see who he was. Secondly, he spoke to them. So God wants you to hear him, and God wants you to see him in the storms of your life. Otherwise, what's the purpose of a storm? And by the way, didn't he say, go to the other side? Didn't he say that? What's, that's the word of the Lord. God told these disciples, go to the other side. That is God's word. How can you sink if God told you that? You see, God told them, but they didn't believe the word of God. That's the problem. So here is a guy, Nehemiah, that had everything going for him, and he had this incredible heart, and he finished well. 52 days he was done. Gehazi, he didn't finish well. Solomon, he didn't finish well. We know pastors, they don't finish well. Well, I want to finish well. That's important to me. So let's take a look at Nehemiah. Four, four things I want to teach you this morning that I think are really, really, really important. And we find four words I'm going to give you. Number one, a word you know so well, patience. How many of you have patience? Don't raise your hand. <laughs> patience. You know, why does your wife tell you ten times to do something? Because you don't listen. So she has to tell you ten different ways, you know. Do this, do that, take out the trash. Well, she has ten ways to tell me to take out the trash. Why? Because I don't, she knows I'm not listening. So listen, it's easier. Second word, persuaded. Are you persuaded? Are you absolutely persuaded that God's for you, not against you? Do you know that his thoughts are for you and not against you? They're not evil, but they're good to an expected end. Do you know that God does not withhold unless he's more gracious at the end? Do you know that God's thoughts for you are more than all the sands of the seas? Do you know that when you look in heaven and see the clouds, those are the dust of his feet? He flung the stars into existence. He measured the universe with his right hand. Look it up. A span. What's a span? Nine inches. If you're a carpenter, nine inches. Eighteen inches. And then the reed was ten foot tall. So they grab a reed. That's a ten footer. They do a cabinet. Eighteen inches. That is nine inches. He measures the universe with nine inches of his finger. I like this one the best. He takes his right nostril. Opens the Red Sea. It's a big God we're talking about, you know. But, but our, our God can't do nothing. He's not for us. Because cancer gets capital C and Christ is nowhere. But I had cancer, small c, Christ is a big capital. You see, you know, when you look at this, you begin to realize. So let's look at it. And then number three, you have to prepare. Are you prepared? And number four, are you persistent? Steve, how are you going to pull this together? I'm going to show you. It's really kind of fun. It's all in verses 1 through 9. Let's take a look at it. Number one, how do I deal with obstacles? Number one, how do I deal with them? Say, put your kids in there. Put your marriage in there. Put your business in there. Put your church in there. It doesn't make a difference. 
How do I deal with my physical health, spiritual health? Does not make a difference by being patient. Number one lesson, you have to learn patience. Look what he says in Nehemiah chapter 2, verse 1. It came to pass in the month of Nisan, April, four months after what he said, what he said in chapter 1, in the twelfth year of Xerxes, the king, that wine was before him. I took up the wine, gave it unto the king. Now I had not been before time saddened in his presence. In other words, he had been able to keep it somewhat together. He was quiet before God. But notice the first thing he did. He was what? He was waiting on God. He did not complain. He did not go grab a phone. He didn't call anybody. He didn't tell anybody. He bowed his knee before God built that relationship. So the same thing happens when you're flying. I flew a Learjet one time and the pilot, you know, I was, I was doing a pretty good job. And, and all of a sudden he says, we've got to make a correction. I said, why? He says, you're two degrees off. I said, well, he said, the way you're going, we're going to happen in Hawaii. But we're going to die because we're going to run out of gas. Said, okay, I'll correct it. So I corrected it. Did great. Every, no one knew. And so all of a sudden, he says, now, uh, we just dropped 1,000 feet. And you're on a head-on collision with another plane. Oh, that's not good. What happened? Well, when you turn back, you didn't give it, you know, the thrust it needed. And so as you turn, the drag dropped it down. So I brought it back up, but I went too far, 4,000 feet. Kept their wings straight. Everything's cool. He says, now, you're way out. So we got to bring it back down. So when you're lost, what do you do? First thing you do, you climb. Why? Because you don't want to hit a mountain. Number one rule in a plane, you climb. That's what you do in prayer. Number two, you communicate. You don't say, hey, how are you doing down there? I'm talking to this guy down in the station. Hey, I'm lost up here. I don't know where I'm going. You don't do that. You say, get me down quick. Because you don't know what you're going to hit. You don't know how much gas you have. You don't, you're, you're, you're lost. Number three, you have to once again confess. You can't be saying, hey, how's it going down there? I just want to talk. You know, I'm just up here. No, you want to say, I am lost. Now, guys have a hard time with that. Guys have a real difficult time with GPS because they don't like that woman telling them what to do. <laughs> and they, so for some reason, they don't believe that satellite. They think they know better. Though they don't know what street's in front of them, and that satellite does. They cannot accept it. I have guys on my staff that argue with that thing day and night drives me crazy i don't like them those guys and then all of a sudden you know so they get lost now let me give you an example the wise men when did they finally find christ how old was christ two years old they followed the star right it says that christ was in a house so i just kind of blew the whole manger thing didn't i sorry but he was in a house two years old well that makes sense because guys get lost now put a woman they would have found him in two weeks because they go to a gas station. A guy goes to a gas station. Hey, well, I, I'm lost. Okay, go here, go there, turn right, turn left, turn right, 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 left. And the wife's just saying, oh, Lord, Jesus, help me, Father. The guy gets back, and the wife says, "You got? I got it right here. Got it. Honey, did you write any of that down? No, I didn't. I got it. It's okay. He has no idea what he's talking about. He's lying. So, again, we see you have to wait. Because when all of a sudden with Heather, I had to wait. Fifteen years I had to wait. And three scriptures God gave me. Be still and know that I'm God. Be still. Be quiet, Stephen, and know that I'm God. Stand still and see the salvation of God. Remember that, Moses? And then, you remember what Naomi said to Ruth? Set still till he's done his work. So it's not you telling me or me getting information. Why am I in this mess? Because my broken relationship with God. God I'm lost. I need help. The first thing Nehemiah did, because he was such a great guy, was he had the ability to turn to God. I don't know what to do. Sometimes God shows you something about a spouse. You go tell him. Now, did God tell you to do that? No. Then why did you tell him? Well, he told me. That doesn't give you a right to go tell somebody. If God spoke to you, why did he speak to you? I don't know. Well, why don't you ask God? Did he give you a green light, yellow light, or red light? What do you mean? You know, well, if God shows me something about my wife, am I just going to walk in and tell her what God showed me? I don't think so. I did that. It didn't work. Well, why doesn't? You're the head. I know I'm the head, but she's the neck, and she turns it any way she wants. That's just the way it is. <laughs> so I got to make sure. So sometimes God says green light. Go for it. Sometimes God says yellow light. Sometimes God says red light. Don't you dare share what I shared. I gave you that information. Check it out. 
to pray for your wife? Well, I never thought about that. I know. Why? Because we just move too quick. We don't wait. See, prayer is waiting on God. He waited for four months. And what was he waiting for? He was not going to ask the king. This is what he said. God, you hold the king's heart in your hand. So, God, you do it. Well, I'm not getting a raise. Well, why should you get a raise? Well, I'm working hard. No, the Bible says that promotion comes not from the east nor from the west, but where? You want to say it? But from the Lord. Promotion comes not from a boss or somebody else. It's God giving you that promotion. So some people, I've been with you 13 years. No, you've been with me one year, 13 times. You see, every year you're not growing. You've stopped growing. So when God sees you consistent, when God sees you growing, then God begins to promote you. But he's looking for that excellent spirit. So prayer, it says in Isaiah 30, verse 15, For thus saith the Lord God, the Holy One of Israel, In returning and rest shall ye be saved, and quietness and confidence shall be your strength. But you said nay. So where's your strength? You're going to mount up the wings of eagles and what? Fly. You're going to run and not faint. You're going to walk and not stumble. In other words, they that wait. Why are you waiting? Because you don't know what to do. You thought you did, but it wasn't right. But the moment you bow a knee, heaven goes crazy. Because now you're looking for a supernatural answer to a situation. And remember, Satan only attacks in relationships. And we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers. And he comes and he tries to destroy our marriages and our relationships and our guys and girlfriends and whatever it might be. He wants to destroy us. So we need to wait on God. In Psalm 27, 13, I had fainted unless I had believed and waited. And then one more in Psalm 37, 34, wait on the Lord. Keep his ways and he shall exalt thee to inherit the land. When the wicked are cut off, thou shalt see it. Wait. Secondly, not only did he wait, but secondly, check it out. How do I deal with these obstacles? Being persuaded. Look at verse 2 and 3. He was persuaded. Wherefore the king said unto me, Why is thy countenance sad, seeing thou art not sick? Interesting. This is nothing else but sorrow of heart, Nehemiah. Then I was very afraid and said to the king, Let the king live forever. Why should not my countenance be sad when the city and the place of my father's sepulchers lie as waste and the gates thereof are consumed? You see, he did not lie he did not hold back he was absolutely persuaded this was the moment he was going to speak why he had been praying for four months when you are praying and you're asking god to open a door guess what he does he opens the door what i have found out is people when they see that they don't want to do anything what's what are you going to do i don't know well what are you praying for i don't know what would you like god to do i don't know but why were you praying i don't know we're going to name you I don't know you know it's like you know or all of a sudden you've been asking God to do something then the phone rings would you like to change your job I don't know what have you been praying for the last year give me a new job what could it possibly be or what did Moses do when he was to go through the Red Sea he's praying and what did God say now is not the time to pray now it's time to move you see he was out of balance sometimes we should be moving when we should be doing that but we're praying sometimes we're praying we should be moving sometimes we're moving we should be praying in other words you can't be in the perfect harmony until you are together with god it's a real simple study well steve what's the problem why am i always out of whack because you're not in whack with christ if this is christ and this is you what's the cross when god wants to go this way you don't want to go so you can have all these wrong relationships but is it the person no is it you? Yeah. Will it ever be the church? No. Will it ever be my wife? No. It will always be me. Why? Because if I get right with God, everything else turns straight. It's there. It's right here. Against you and you only have I sinned. So it's not other people. It's me. Either I'm not communicating or I'm not standing or I'm not doing this thing, but I'm letting this stuff eat me up. That's not what you do. You go before God. You wait. You seek. You pray. You fast. You're serious. You're in desperate need for God to work. And secondly, you're persuaded now. Why? Because all of a sudden the king says, what's wrong with you? <gasps> the king answered me. 
four months, and did Nehemiah see, oh, I'm afraid. No, Nehemiah, you've been asking God to speak to the king, to speak to you. Guess what he's doing? See, we're not real tuned in spiritually. And guess what he says? Yes. He says, how can I be any other way? I'm kind of bummed because my people are destroyed. And that's a good answer. Number three, so powerful. Number three goes on to say, how do I deal with obstacles? And here it is. Number four is the biggest point. Being prepared. I don't understand. When you begin to pray, God begins to prepare your heart. What do you mean? Well, when you are quiet before God, God begins to speak to you. I have a book I carry around, my journal. I write everything in it. God speaks to me, I write it down. I read my Bible, I write things. I never go anywhere without my journal. And because it is the moment where God begins to speak. And so here, all of a sudden, it says, pray without ceasing. So I've been praying without ceasing, but all of a sudden I'm praying, but who is God changing? Tell me. Is he changing the king or is he changing me? Me. Is he changing my wife? I, no, I wish, but no, he's changing me. Because she comes up and she goes, where would you like to have dinner tonight? I said, oh, no, not this one. What are you talking about? I said, honey, we're talking about something. No, what? Honey, I just don't want to talk about this. Stephen, what's wrong with you? Nothing, honey. Where would you like to eat tonight? And honey, can we just like, you pick it and I'll just go wherever you want to go. And she was starting to get mad with me. I said, okay, I want to go to Outback. I don't like Outback. Why do we have to go there? <laughs> you know, I thought you wanted me to pick it. Every single time it happens. So I said, I don't want to go down this road. And just pick it. <laughs> so, you know, it's like, but I, here's what God shows me. I, I haven't, the button's still there. She can still push it. See, God finally took the button out with my daughter. So she could push it all day. I didn't move. None of these things moved me. Neither did I count my heart dear, that I might finish the course with joy, the ministry that God has set before me. And I'm not going to be moved. My husband can do what he wants. I'm not moving. If he moves and you move, the distance between you two are bigger. If you don't move and your kids move, the distance is not that far. But if they move and you move, the distance is way out of the way. You have to stand in the ground. You have to stand there. And so he prepared. It says in verse 4, Then the king said to me, For what dost thou make a request? What do you want? I don't know. I just hate that, you know. Tell me what you want. Well, I think he want. He says, this is what I want to do. He says here, so I prayed in the God of heaven. And Philippians 4, 6, be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer, supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be known to God. You can be very crystal clear. You can speak it with authority. And then Psalm 37, verse 5, commit thy way unto the Lord. Trust also in him and he shall bring it to pass. Do you know that there was a time, you probably read it in Ezra, where he stood, he read the word of God, and the people stood from day to night? You think, Ma, I want that in my heart. Why did they do that? Well, there's a reason why. Because why do all these people stand before Ezra? We would not do that. Well, there's a reason. When they came back into the land, Ezra was reading the word of God. He came across the genealogy. He began to read. And every name, if your name got read, that means you own a house inside the city. And you got it back for free. So you think you stand there and listen to it? You bet your life you would. If you didn't hear your name read, you'd have to go outside the city and live. So people are motivated by the word of God. And so we realize here he was prepared. And then check it out, that one last one. How did we deal with this obstacle? By being persistent. Three things. This is what Nehemiah wanted to do. And this is what will happen with you. If you wait four months, if you just give God a moment of your time, if you just believe God with all your heart and soul and mind that God will never let you down, three things, and this is Nehemiah speaking to the most powerful man of the country at that time. He said, number one, I need your permission. Look at verse five and six. I said to the king, if it please the king, here, you hear that? If it pleases you. If thy servant has found favor in thy sight, that thou would send me unto Judah. I don't want to go by myself. I want you to send me. Then I know it's God. You see, I don't want to call D.C. and say, can I come up there and speak? I don't want that. Because I don't know if it's God. But if they call me, I know it's God. And what, I, what they're going to get is I'm going to hold the word of God. I'm not going to call Neil and say, can I come on Fox? Because I'd be scared to death. But if he calls me, I know it's God. So I'm not going to go back. 
That's the authority God wants in your life. He goes on to say in verse 6, The king said to me, the queen also said him by him, For how long shall the journey be? Good question. And when will thou return? So it pleased the king to send me, and I set him a time. He, later on we read three years. I need three years. Okay. Because not only do I want to rebuild the wall, I want to get the people together. Great. The king said, good. I will send you out. This is a heathen king. How do you change a heathen king? How do you take a mayor? How do you change the president of the United States? How do you do change a CEO? You pray your hearts out. God will wake him up in the middle of the night. It could be that. How do you reach a kid that you love that's out there, like my daughter? You can't reach him, but you can sure say, God, you hold Heather's heart in your hands. Would you? And you're a better father than I am. Would you help her? Sure, Steve. I'd love to help you. Will you forgive her? If you don't forgive her, Stephen, no matter what I do, it's not going to help you. And by the way, you have been living in darkness, son, because you are unwilling to forgive, so your soul is darkened. And you've been teaching the people of South Bay, and you've been in sin. That's just about killed me right there. And so I realized that it's light and darkness. Number two, not only I need permission, I need your permission, sir. Number th- two, I need your provision. I need your provision. Verse 7 and 8. Moreover, I said unto the king, if it please, see, very polite, if it please the king, let a letter be given to me of the governors beyond the river. And then verse 8, a letter also to the keeper of the king's forest because I need to make beams in the city and in the walls and over the gates and I need to have the timber for the side of the gates and the tops and and for the, you know the king studs and everything else I need to have these okay fine I need two letters okay great you got them brilliant so when did all this come to him well I tell you what when he's praying he's thinking when I'm beginning to build I'm thinking how many doors how many this how many I'm just thinking but when he's praying He's thinking, okay, if he asks me, I better have an answer. I want to have an answer. So we think that have an answer for every man. Is that just Christ? Is that just that? Or is that your boss at work? That's your boss at work. They finally say, hey, come on, I want to talk to you. Well, I haven't talked to the CEO for a long time. Well, I'm here. What are you going to say? I don't know. If he says, what do you like? Do you like anything? Would you like it? Yeah, I would. By the way, thanks for calling me up here. And then you tell him what's on your heart. You're not afraid of anybody. And then lastly, not only do I need your... Uh, your 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 um, permission. Second, I need your provision. But third, I need your protection. Verse nine. He says, "Then came to the governor beyond the river and gave them the king's letter. Now the king has sent the captain of the army of the horsemen with me." That's so cool, you know, because all of a sudden you realize that Nehemiah had an army because the king wanted him back. The king wanted to make sure this was successful. But Nehemiah still had to prepare everything. But all I'm saying is, to me, when I read this, I think it was God working in Nehemiah's life, don't you? It was God speaking to Nehemiah. So here's what I think happens. We get so hurt, so bitter with God, that we forget to let God in. And then we get upset with God because he doesn't do anything. Well, what did Martha say? If you would have been here, my brother would not have died. What did Jesus say? He's not dead. See, or what did Peter say? No, I'm not going to deny you. And, and Jesus said, Peter, before you hear the cock crow three times, you're going to deny me three times. No, never. Peter, Satan has ripped you, and Satan's going to beat you, but I have prayed that you are going to overcome, and when you do, you're going to straighten the brother. So all of a sudden, Peter was there. I don't know the man. Guess what? He's warming himself by the fire of the world. He had the Holy Spirit, but now he has this fire of the world. He walked afar off. He took a whack at the servant with the sword of the flesh. I don't know where a fisherman gets a sword. He's out of, he's totally in the flesh. He's not yielding. He's not surrendering. He's swinging. So when I start swinging, I'm in the flesh. Finally, he walks afar off. He's warming himself. And then they kept coming after Peter. Boom, boom, boom. Cursed be the man. I don't know the man. And Jesus, the Bible says in Mark, Mark, and Jesus looked and Peter looked and their eyes hit. And Peter remembered the word of the Lord. That's what I need. I need God to speak to me like he's never spoke to me ever before in my life. 
that I'm doing what he wants me to do. That's more important than a Sunday morning, a large church, or anything else. And I can tell you that you can have your children back, you can have your marriage back, but somebody has to pray. And Jesus said, I don't find men willing to pray. And who is going to stand in the gap? The only way you can solve your problem is you have to understand why you have the problem. You got there because you were not praying. You've got to get back. You have to be prepared. You have to be persuaded because we lose heart. We lose focus. We have no confidence. And here's what he says. I'll end it right here. If your heart condemns you, you have one greater God. But if your heart does not condemn you, you have access to God. So either way, you're fine. You can come to God and God will give you his heart or you can run into God because you have access with God. But never is there a time in your life that God doesn't love you. All the things that we lose and suffer because we will not simply give God four months of our lives.